Okay, so uh, welcome back. If you're joining me for the first time, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm reading uh, the entirety of the Quran during the month of Ramadan, blessed month of Ramadan. So uh, it's a great way to get to know the Muslim faith of Islam. And uh, right now we're on the sixth juz or the sixth section uh, of, um, of the Quran. So there's previous videos, you can tune into them at your leisure. But uh, basically what I do as I read through it is I provide my own personal reflections. I preface that once again, I'm not a scholar. Uh, so, you know, consult scholarship for deep issues, uh, nor do I have authority to issue an opinion on the Quran. Rather, these are just my own personal reflections as I read through the texts. Uh, side by side with me, I do have uh, Tafsida Sadi, who uh, said he is a scholar, and he does expunge a little bit on the topics of interest. So um, I'll definitely be reading some of the uh, hot ticket items, if you will. And then I do have the link posted up for any non-Muslim guests to join me at any time. I do ask that you please remain patient while I finish through the reading, because that is my ultimate goal is to get through the reading. And then I will graciously host you so that we can have a uh, dialogue and a discussion on anything that you may have um, regarding any questions that you may have regarding Islam. And I'll do my very best to answer them to the best of my abilities. So with that being said, <clears throat> anytime that we approach the Quran, just as a healthy reminder, the first thing that we do is we make ablution or wudu, uh, that way that we can physically purify ourselves. And then we set our intention right to seek knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the source of all knowledge. That way that we can have uh, uh, a clean heart and a clean approach with sincerity, which is something that he does ask of us. And uh, next up is you ask for protection against the accursed shaitan. So you say, I would be lahim in a shaitan regime. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And with that said, let's just go ahead and uh, dive right in. So we are on Surat and Nisa, which is the women. And women are extremely honored in Islam. Uh, they are uh, uh, very much so cherished and loved, and they've been given a special status. Uh, and the things that we covered last time were things like issues of like divorce and marriage, and there's all sorts of great detail and nuances in the Quran, which really can't be found in any other book. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us guide on, guidelines on not only how to conduct ourselves towards our women, but also uh, how to make sure that they're taken care of in the event of a separation, which I find to be uh, absolutely incredible and unique. So uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on. So this is verse 148. Uh, Allah does not like the public mention of evil except by one who has been wronged and ever is Allah hearing and knowing. If instead you show some good or conceal it or pardon an offense, indeed Allah is ever pardoning and competent. Indeed, those who disbelieve in Allah and his messengers and wish to discriminate between Allah and his messengers and say, we believe in some and disbelieve in others and wish to adopt the way in between. Those are the disbelievers, truly. And we have prepared for them, for the disbelievers, a humiliating punishment. So this is a pretty uh, key and common thing that's happening. And this is an, a concept of innovation. So people are cherry picking almost like if it's like a buffet and you like what one person says and you don't like what another person says, uh, or you're fishing for something that's gonna be some type of a, a deviation apart from what Islam is. And notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says his messengers, which is plural. And, and as a Muslim, we believe that all the messengers were, were uh, upon Islam, which is upon submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the message was the same, which was to believe in and worship the only deity worthy of worship, which is God and uh, to follow the messenger. So every single messenger was the way, uh, but none of them were the destination. Uh, they were, uh, the destination is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because uh, we were created by him and to him we will return. Okay, so commonly here, uh, people wish to adopt that middle way or, or excuse me, uh, wish to adopt a way of innovation uh, between these messengers. And this is where that um, distancing from Islam happens. And likewise, uh, this is very common in the Christian faith. Unfortunately, you know, they're not listening to what Jesus or Isa actually says, but they start listening to what Paul says or what John or what Mark or Matthew 
uh, who are just, you know, many of these authors are completely anonymous of the Gospels, and now we have the result that we have. So um, tons of sects, tons of deviations, no one really knows how many books are canon, and it's just chaos. So those are the disbelie those are the disbelievers truly, and we have prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment. But they who believe in Allah and his messengers and do not discriminate between any of them to those he is going to give their reward and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So it's incumbent on us as Muslims to believe in all the messengers. The people of the scripture ask you to bring down to them a book from the heaven. Uh, but they had asked of Moses even greater than that and said, Show us a law outright. So the thunderbolt struck them for their wrongdoing. Then they took the calf for worship after clear evidences had come to them. And we pardoned that. And we gave Moses a clear authority. And we raised over them the mount for refusal of their covenant. And we said to them, enter the gate bowing humbly. And we said to them, do not transgress on the Sabbath and we took from them a solemn covenant. And we cursed them for their breaking of the covenant and their disbelief in the signs of Allah and their killing of the prophets without right and their saying, our hearts are wrapped, i.e. sealed against reception. Rather, Allah has sealed them because of their disbelief and they believe not except for a few. So again, uh, it's a consequence. The ceiling is a consequence because of that disbelief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that very, very clear. And uh, their path to full-blown disbelief was, was um, justified by all of their uh, egregious actions from the things that they have done uh, to previous prophets along with changing the scriptures. And we curse them for their disbelief and they're saying against Mary a great slander. So what was said against Mary, uh, obviously, we believe that uh, Maryam alayhi salam, she, uh, excuse me, Maryam radiallahu anha is a, um, she was uh, given a um, uh, Isa alayhi salam and had a, a virgin basically birth. So uh, there was a great slander that was put against her. You know, they were saying just all sorts of things. It's not really worth mentioning because we really do love uh, Mary. So uh, if you're inclined to researching in depth into what was said, you know, I go ahead and welcome you to do that. And as for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And notice the, the strict um, distancing between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he mentions uh, Jesus or Isa's lineage, right? Indeed, uh, the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. So there's a big distancing between messengership and, you know, a claim to divinity. So just note, take, take note of that. It's a very common uh, thing that's happening in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, extremely high, way well beyond his creation in every capacity. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him for certain. So uh, there's different theories as to what could have happened to Isa alayhi salam. We actually are not given an answer. So there's something called the substitution theory where he was replaced by somebody else. There is something called the swoon theory, which is basically that he um, got knocked out. So like he got knocked unconscious on the cross but he was not crucified on the cross, and that's with certainty. Uh, so there's a you know theory that since he got knocked unconscious, that he was transported somewhere else. Uh, and then the last theory is uh, there's one of like authorship. So for example, the authors of the Bible, whom which we don't know who they are, uh, they're anonymous. Uh, they wrote in the crucifixion, right? So now it's a it's it's more of like a psychological play or like a belief on what actually had happened. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assures us that um, these people are in complete doubt. They're following nothing but conjecture, and they have no knowledge of it other than assumptions. And then he reassures us with certainty uh, that he indeed was not killed. Rather, Allah raised him to himself, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. And I just also want to take a, another, just a quick second here. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not elect messengers and then humiliate them. 
So crucifixion is a very, very, very humiliating uh, form of death. You know, you're basically just left out to, to rot and you're in excruciating pain and, you know, you're, everything is revealed. You know, you're not, you're basically not going to be wearing any clothes. So it's, uh, I personally, you know, found it very harsh when I was studying Christianity that um, they would uh, honor something like this, right? And it's it's just really disheartening, okay? So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the uh, most merciful, uh, the ever merciful, and uh, the most forgiving would not elect a servant and then all of a sudden leave him uh, in this capacity, in my opinion. Okay. And there is none from the people of the scripture but that he will surely believe in him, which is Isa, before his death. Uh, and on the day of resurrection, he will be again, um, he will be again them uh, to them a witness. So uh, naturally, we believe in the second coming, right? And I think what this is referencing is uh, Isa Alayhi Salam's second coming, especially when he's battling the Antichrist, okay? Um, those people of the previous scripture, when they see him coming back and they see him uh, submitting in a state of Islam, is Islam, right? In a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they will know for certain that he is indeed a Muslim. For uh, wrongdoing on the part of the Jews, we made unlawful for them certain good foods which had been lawful to them, and for their averting from the way of Allah many people, and for their taking of usury while they had been forbidden from it, and they're consuming of the people's wealth unjustly. And we have prepared for the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. So you can see that the Jews not only uh, changed the scriptures, but they were actually treating people differently. So they were averting people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by uh, the shifting of the scripture. And then also for taking um, usury while they had been forbidden from it and consuming other people's uh, wealth unjustly. So they would have different types of contracts and different types of criteria for contracts between themselves in comparison to uh, others. So people that were Jewish were treated differently, had special treatment, and people that were non-Jewish uh, were treated differently and also had specialized treatment, but rather for um, the detriment, right? So it was just not a good thing. But those firm in knowledge among them and the believers uh, and the believers believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what was revealed before you, and the establishers of prayer, especially, and the givers of zakat, and the believers in Allah and the last day, those we will give a great reward. Carrying on. Uh, indeed, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we revealed to Noah and the prophets after him, and we revealed to Abraham. Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, the descendants, Jesus, Job, Jonah, Aaron, and Solomon, and to David, we gave the book of Psalms. So all of these prophets had some type of revelation that were that were um, provided to them. So you can see the chain in Islam. You can see what the claim is that all of these were indeed messengers and uh, they were communicating with the creator uh, in some capacity or another. And we sent messengers about whom we have related their stories to you before and messengers about whom we have not related to you. And Allah spoke to Moses with direct speech. So uh, again, in Islam, we believe that just because the, the, these aren't the only messengers, the ones that are mentioned, we believe that messengers were sent to uh, all people at all times um, consistently and in perpetuity, right? Exactly what was destined for them. However, what's unique about the Quran and what's unique about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that he was sent for all of mankind and he was sent for both the seen and the unseen world. So this is a message pertaining to you, okay? And he is your messenger. Now it's just a, a whether or not you want to accept or deny that. Okay. We sent messengers as bringers of good tidings and warners so that mankind will have no argument against Allah after the messengers. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. But Allah bears witness to that which he has revealed to you. He has sent it down with his knowledge and the angels bear witness as well. And sufficient is Allah as witness. Now, this is really interesting because um, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need any witnesses. He is indeed God. He is all knowing. So uh, the fact that he brings out his angels, but then reinforces it with sufficient of a witness is Allah, 
uh, you know, you, you should just know right off the bat that um, this isn't going to be like a trial by jury, right? You're, you're going to have, it's not like you're going to have like a lawyer and then there's all these peers and all this other stuff. No, everything is going to be out there in the open. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being all knowledgeable and all knowing, uh, knows everything that you're doing, what you're thinking, what all true possibilities are, and, and as well as uh, their connections. Indeed, those who disbelieve and avert people from the way of Allah have certainly gone far astray. Indeed, those who disbelieve and commit wrong or injustice never will Allah forgive them, nor will he guide them to a path, except the path of hell. They will abide therein forever, and that for Allah is always easy. O mankind, a messenger has come to you with the truth from your Lord, so believe it is better for you. But if you disbelieve, then indeed to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah knowing and wise. O people of the scriptures, or O people of the scripture, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah and his word, which he directed to Mary and a soul created at a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Desist, it is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. Exalted is he above having a son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and sufficient is Allah as a disposer of affairs. And again, this is just such a critical piece and such a massive, massive dogmatic difference between uh, Christianity and Islam. We don't associate any partnership whatsoever with the lost Panathada. We don't say that, uh, you know, like the Christians do, that Isa Islam was responsible for creation. Uh, he is not. And uh, neither is he going to be responsible for judgment. Right. So um, this is a, a clear cut, clear cut. Uh, differentiation between Islam as well as uh, and, and Christianity. Never would the Messiah disdain to be a servant of Allah, nor would the angels near to him. And whoever disdains his worship and is arrogant, he will gather them to himself altogether. And as for those who believed and did righteous deeds, he will give them in full their reward and grant them extra from his bounty. But as for those who disdained, and were arrogant, he will punish them with a painful punishment, and they will not find for themselves, besides Allah, any protector or helper. So um, again, there's just that system of reward and a system of punishment. And imagine, just imagine what um, uh, Isa or Jesus's reaction is going to be on the day of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him the question, you know, did you claim yourself to be divine or did you elevate yourself to a status of divine? You know, this messenger is not going to attest in the affirmative at all. Rather, he's going to attribute um, gl all glory, all power, all everything in regards to lordship to his creator, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, there's uh, that system of reward and there's even extra in it for you. And it's, it's giving you the conditions. OK, here's a condition of arrogance. So if you're somebody that's arrogant and you're not willing to learn or not willing to have conversations that are just beneficial, then again, um, this is you're you're headed towards an, the path of wrong. OK, uh, however, you if you are headed towards righteousness, if you're headed towards um, proper dialogue, sincerity and so on, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no problem, no problem whatsoever rewarding you from his bounty. O oh, mankind, there has come to you a conclusive proof from your Lord, and we have sent down to you a clear light. So those who believe in Allah and hold fast to him, he will admit them to mercy from himself and bounty and guide them to himself on a straight path. Okay, obviously that uh, light is the Quran. Uh, amongst that, also his messenger as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They request from you a legal ruling. Say Allah gives you a ruling concerning one having neither descendants nor ascendants as heirs. If a man dies leaving no child but only a sister, she will have half of what he left and he inherits from her if she dies and has no child. But if there are two sisters or more, they will have two thirds of what he left. 
If there are both brothers and sisters, the male will have the share of two females. Allah makes clear to you his law, lest you go astray, and Allah is knowing of all things. Now, something that's unique about this is you may kind of think like, why does this particular thing seem like it's out of place? Okay. However, it's not. This is actually one of the miraculous things about the Quran, uh, that there was questions that were being asked to the prophet and on the spot revelation would come down. Okay. On the spot revelation would come down. So exactly what was happening here, right. And you know, we could explore it, uh, in the tafsir, but the question that was being asked to the messenger, and this could be seven years into prophethood. It could be nine years into prophethood. You know, we can figure out exactly, you know, when this verse came down. Uh, but, uh, on the spot when he would speak, remember this is, he would not speak of himself. Right. So this is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the revelation came down to the, the question that was being asked. All right. So that does conclude uh, Surah An-Nisa. Now we're coming up on the very next Surah, which is Al-Ma'idah, which is, uh, I believe, the table spread. So again, it starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is uh, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most graceful, the most merciful. And here we uh, we go. O oh, you who have believed, fulfill all contracts. Lawful for you are the animals of grazing livestock, except for that which is uh, recited to you in the Quran. Hunting not being permitted while you are in the state of ihram. Indeed, Allah ordains what he intends. Uh, ihram is when you're conducting pilgrimage, you enter into a state of ihram, which is almost kind of like a, a sanctified state. Um, you basically wear two white uh, pieces of cloth that are unthreaded. Uh, similar to replicate of what you're going to be buried with in the grave, because we basically came into this world with nothing and we're going to be leaving with nothing uh, apart from our deeds, right? So interestingly, also, we have one of the very first um, revelations in regards to uh, dietary, uh, a dietary revelation, okay? So lawful for you are the animals of grazing livestock, except for that which is recited to you in this Quran, okay? So um, naturally, there's going to be things that come later, and perhaps there may have been even some mention that I'm just not quite uh, remembering right now, so forgive me for that uh, previously what was mentioned. O oh, you who have believed, do not violate the rights of Allah or the sanctity of the sacred month or neglect the marking of the sacrificial animals and garlanding them or violate the safety of those coming to the sacred house seeking bounty from their Lord and his approval. But when you come out of Ihram, you may hunt and do not let the hatred of a people for having obstructed you from Al-Masjid Al-Haram lead you to transgress and cooperate in righteousness and piety and do not cooperate in sin and aggression oh, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is severe in penalty. If I remember correctly, what was going on over here is um, because the native Arabs at the time thought that they were so close to uh, Masjid Al-Haram they were giving special treatment to other native Arabs, okay? And the people that were conducting migration from far away, they had to take extra steps to kind of go around certain spots in order to avoid that special treatment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was warning them not to um, consider it as a mark of aggression, rather just to remain peaceful. Uh, that way that um, they can complete their pilgrimage. Okay. Fantastic. Very next verse. Uh, it comes more into the dietary laws. So prohibited to you are dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to, to other than Allah, and those animals killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the goring of horns and those from which a wild animal has eaten. And uh, now I do remember that there was some uh, dietary talk, and I believe it was in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second chapter. So uh, uh, dead animals, uh, prohibited to you are dead animals. Now, there's obviously a condition. It's not something that was recently killed, but rather if you were to find like roadkill, okay? Uh, blood, so we're not allowed to consume like raw blood. You know how there's like, um, there's uh, delicacies right now and so on that have like, they're called like blood soup. Um, and there's other, all sorts of like other things that involve blood, uh, the flesh of swine. So obviously no pork and that, which has been dedicated to other than a lot. So if there was a sacrifice that was made to like an idol or something like that, it's forbidden for us to eat it. 
um, killed by strangling or by violent blow or by headlong fall. So obviously we have a special treatment of animals. We respect animals as Muslim and we, uh, there's a process that needs to be, that needs to take place. So we can't just, you know, conduct the, um, mass killings of animals, like how they're being conducted in slaughterhouses, you know, like, a uh, a blow, a violent blow, like, you know, how you have those like um, piston guns right now where they just basically pop them in the head, uh, all the shards and the bones and everything like that. It just, you know, and then sometimes the animal doesn't even pass away. So, um, you know, we have rules on how we slaughter animals uh, killed by strangling or, or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by goring of the horns uh, or those, for, those from which a wild animal has eaten. Now we can't take what was given to another animal, right? There's an ecosystem. So this, this to me is in regards to the protection of ecosystem. And you also don't know what, um, what the freshness of the carcass is because wild animals can eat stuff that have, you know, that has probably been out for like a day or two where it may not be safe for human consumption. Okay. With like diseases and so on and so forth. Um, uh, accept what you are able to slaughter before its death and those which are sacrificed on stone altars. And prohibited is that you seek decision through divining arrows. So they used to like cast lots and, you know, do all sorts of different um, things to see which, one, which person got the short straw and all that. That is grave disobedience. This day, uh, those who disbelieve have despaired of defeating your religion. So fear them not, but fear me. This day I have perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved for you Islam as a religion. But whoever is forced by severe hunger with no inclination to sin, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. And again, here is the door of mercy being opened once again in Islam. So if you're in a state of uh, where you're going to pass away or you're suffering from severe hunger, the restrictions are lifted so you can survive. So in those circumstances, you can eat pork and you can... Uh, use your better judgment whether or not you want to uh, touch a carcass that's that's has been on the ground that's been on the ground and so on. They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what has been made lawful for them? Say, lawful for you are all good food and game caught by what you have trained of hunting animals, which you train as Allah has taught you. So eat of what they catch for you and mention the name of Allah upon it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. And this is pretty cool because it's referencing things like, you know, if you were to use like um, hunting dogs or something to that extent, right? There is a, a really neat uh, ability to utilize existing animals to hunt down prey and to help people um, use them as kind of tools, right? Which is pretty cool. And uh, this day, all good food have been made lawful. And the food of those who were given the scripture is lawful for you and your food is lawful for them. And lawful in marriage are chaste women from among the believers and chaste women from among those who were given the scripture before you. When you have given them their due compensation, desiring chastity, not unlawful sexual intercourse or taking secret lovers. And whoever denies the faith, uh, his work has well has become worthless and he in the hereafter will be among the losers so again just a referencing to uh, the importance of marriage and not trying to fool anybody um you because you're only just going to end up fooling yourself if you're thinking that you're going to have some type of a love love fling and that almighty god's not going to know about it oh you who have believed when you rise to perform prayer wash your faces and your forearms uh, to the elbows and wipe over your heads and wash your feet to the ankles and if you are in a state of Janaba, then purify yourselves. Janaba is basically after you've finished um, intercourse with your spouse. But if you are ill or, in, or on a journey, or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself, or you have contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it. Allah does not intend to make difficulty for you, but he intends to purify you and complete his favor upon you that you may be grateful. And this is another um, fantastic point of reference for, for anybody that is a, a hadith rejecter. So anybody that rejects the um, authentic hadith of the Prophet, because uh, you would not know how to properly perform wudu. You would just be wondering, okay, well, wipe your head, but what does that mean? 
how, like what do I just kind of go like this? No, there is a process that was that was um, emulated for us, and there's a sequence that needs to be followed. So same thing with uh, washing your feet to the ankles, and same thing with um, how to properly do uh, tayemum with the dirt, right? So uh, likewise, what does wash your face mean? Okay, and your forearm to the elbow. Do I just do the top, right? Or do I have to kind of do the whole thing, right, to the elbow? So we have a, a beautiful emulation. And this is why the Prophet Isa was uh, also called the walking Quran because of, of his ability to help us better connect with what was being said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember the favor of Allah upon you and his covenant with which he bound you when uh, you said, we hear and we obey and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is knowing of that within of that within the breasts. O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses uh, in justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is fully aware of what you do. And there's this constant theme of being uh, just and justice in the Quran. So it's incumbent on us to stand up to injustice and to and to uh, be a beacon of justice in the face of adversity. Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds that for them there is forgiveness and a great reward. So there's your promise and yet another guarantee from uh, the all-merciful Lord that we worship. Uh, but those who disbelieve and deny our signs, those are the companions of hellfire. O oh, you who have believed, remember the favor of Allah upon you when a people determined to extend their hands in aggression against you. But he withheld their hands from you and fear Allah and upon Allah let the believers rely. And Allah had already taken a covenant from the children of Israel and we delegated from among them 12 leaders. And Allah said, I am with you. If you establish prayer and give zakat and believe in my messengers and support them and loan Allah a goodly loan, I will surely remove from you your misdeeds and admit you to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But whoever of you disbelieves after that has certainly strayed uh, from the soundness of the way. So for their breaking of the covenant, we cursed them and made their hearts hardened. They distort words from their proper places or usages and have forgotten a portion of what they uh, uh, have forgotten a portion of which they were reminded and you will still observe deceit among them except a few of them but pardon them and overlook their misdeeds indeed Allah loves the doers of good so once again a healthy reminder a bunch of pardoning and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does indeed love um, the doers of good okay uh, and from those who say, we are Christians, we took their covenant, but they forgot a portion of, of that of which they were reminded. So we caused among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection, and Allah is going to inform them about what they used to do. O people of the scripture, there has come to you our messenger, making clear to you much of what you used to conceal of the scripture and overlooking much. There has come to you from Allah a light and a clear book, which is the Quran. And I do want to just take a moment here because this particular verse does catch my interest. So this is verse 14 in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And I want to see if, um, if we can get some additional uh, explanations from Asadi or just some additional insights to kind of help us better understand uh, this particular verse. So I believe I was able to locate it. Okay, so here's what Asadi says, uh, uh, 514. So it says, from those who call themselves Christians, we also took a covenant, but they too forgot a portion of what was enjoined upon them. So we have stirred up enmity and hatred among them until the day of resurrection, and soon Allah will inform them of what they used to do. That is, just as we took a covenant from the Jews, we also took a covenant from those who called themselves Christians. That is followers of Isa ibn Maryam, or, or Jesus, the son of Mary. And they have purified themselves by believing in Allah and his messengers and what they brought. But, when they, but then they broke the covenant and forgot a portion of what was enjoined upon them. They forgot knowledge of it and they forgot how to act upon it. So we have stirred up enmity and hatred among them until the day of resurrection. That is, we turned them against one another and troubles and conflicts arose among them, which generated hatred and enmity towards one another. 
which will last until the day of resurrection. This is something that we see for, for the Christians that are still and will continue to be in a state of mutual hatred, enmity, and division. And soon Allah will inform them of what they used to do and punish them for it. Okay, so not a, a giant es, a, a explanation there, but here's what it does make me think about when I did read that tafsir. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the councils of Nicaea, um, but basically during those councils, they were trying to determine uh, which portions of God were to be labeled as divine. Now, I know portions is not necessarily the best term to use, but basically what was happening between um, Irenaeus and Athanasius at the time was they were uh, arguing whether or not the son was divine, just like the father, uh, or whether or not he was subordinate. And Irenaeus, or the Arian Christians at the time, they were arguing that the, the son was subordinate. And Athanasius was arguing that he was uh, not subordinate. And what happened was, uh, basically, the emperor at the time, Constantine, he was a pagan. So he basically said, look, you guys need to not eliminate our roots and I'll support you in the decision that you say. Uh, so after there was an argument back and forth, there was uh, what they would call a democratic process. OK, heavy bunny ears. Right. Um, uh, Athanasius had won the creedal decision, meaning that the son was now um, supposedly co-equal with the father okay now what that did was anybody who was an Aryan christian was declared a heretic <laughs> and basically killed <laughs> so if you were out there propagating an Aryan form of christianity you were put at the stake so this is this is what it made me think about when i was reading the tafsir about the uh, uh, animo uh, animosity and the hatred between between them Right. And even now, in today's times, if you were to go and look at um, if you were to go and look at like, let's say you were to talk to like Jehovah's Witnesses compared to like someone that's Presbyterian, so compared to someone that's Protestant, compared to someone that's, you know, and yada, yada, yada. Everybody thinks that they're upon truth and every one of them condemns the other one to hellfire, basically, because they they believe that they're upon falsehood. Right. So this is a, another type of this animosity that was um, created. So that's just, again, my own personal reflection. But I encourage you guys to go and, and uh, conduct your own research and, and dig a little bit deeper, inshallah. OK. Carrying on. Oh, people of the scripture, there has come to you a mess, uh, our messenger, making clear to you much of what you used to conceal of the scripture and overlook much. There has come to you from Allah a light and a clear book, which is the Quran by which Allah guides those who pursue his pleasure to the ways of peace and brings them out from darkness into the light by his permission and guides them to a straight path. Okay, I know I'm going on a lot of tangents today, but uh, inshallah, it is beneficial. If you were to read the book of Isaiah 42, you will have criteria of a prophecy of a prophet coming. And one of the criteria is that he would lead the, his people uh, from darkness into light. And this is exactly what the Quran is saying right here. Okay. There's other criteria in that as well. So if you were to read the book of Isaiah, there's tons of things of where he's going to go, singing a new song, distributing a new Torah or a new law, um, where it mentions the villages of Sela, it mentions the mountains of Kedah, uh, it mentions all these things where it is it is undoubtedly, undoubtedly the prophet, uh, undoubtedly. Okay. So um i encourage you guys to to open up the book of isaiah and read that uh you can do that online or, or you know if you happen to have a copy of the bible great uh, they have certainly disbelieved uh who say that allah is christ the son of mary so here you go this is addressing um the trinitarians say then those who could prevent uh, say then who could prevent allah at all if he had intended to destroy christ the son of mary or his mother or everyone on earth and to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. He creates what he wills and Allah is over all things competent. So uh, if you were to talk in depth with Christians, they will tell you that the father actually does have all the power. Um, and they'll have to come to the conclusion indeed that, uh, you know, either they're going to run into an issue of multiple gods 
uh, or they're going to have contradictions in what the attributes of the, or the characteristics of God are, um, in which case, either which way, it's extremely troublesome for them. Okay. So, um, but the Jews and the Christians say, we are the children of Allah and his beloved. Say, then why does he punish you for your sins? Rather, you are human beings from among those he has created. He forgives whom he wills, and he punishes whom he wills, and to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them, and to him is the final destination. O people of the scripture, there has come to you our messenger to make, a, a make clear to you the religion after a period of suspension of messengers, lest you say there came not to, uh, to us any bringer of good tidings or a warner. But there has come to you a bringer of good tiding and a warner, and Allah is over all things competent. So you can't claim that messengership didn't come to you uh, unless, of course, you know, you were uh, truly, uh, well, this is referencing to a people of the scripture. So um, this isn't talking about some person being on some like destitute island somewhere. This is rather referencing a specific group of people. And mentioned, O Muhammad, uh, وسلم, when Moses said to his people, O my people, remember the favor of Allah upon you when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the worlds. Uh, o oh my people, enter the blessed land, which is Palestine, which Allah has assigned to you, and do not turn back from fighting in Allah's cause, and thus become losers. They said, O oh Moses, indeed within it is a people of tyrannical strength, and indeed we will never enter it until they leave it. But if they leave it, then we will enter. Said two men from those who feared to disobey upon whom Allah had bestowed favor, enter upon them through the gate, and when you have entered it, you will be predominant. And upon Allah rely if you should be believers. They said, O oh Moses, indeed we will enter it. Uh, excuse me. They said, O oh Moses, indeed we will not enter it ever as long as they are within it. So go you and your Lord and fight. Indeed, we are remaining right here. Moses said, my Lord, indeed, I do not possess or control except myself and my brother. So part us from the defiantly disobedient people. Allah said that indeed it is forbidden to them for 40 years in which they will wander throughout the land. So do not grieve over the defiantly disobedient people and recite to them the story of Adam's two sons in truth when they both made an offering to Allah and it was accepted from one of them but was not accepted from the other said the latter i will surely kill you said the former indeed allah only accepts from the righteous who fear him if you should raise your hand toward me to kill me i shall not raise my hand toward you to kill you indeed i fear allah lord of the worlds indeed i want you to obtain thereby my sin and your sin uh so you will be among the companions of the fire and that is the recompense of wrongdoers now, I'm going to see what um, what Asadi says here. That way that um, we can get a little bit more detail, because remember that uh, everybody is indeed accountable for their own sins. However, I did bring up the concept of if something new were to be innovated to whatever capacity, uh, then that innovation could bear burdens on that person for the innovation. So if you were the very first person to conduct murder, um, every murder after that would be credited to you, uh, not in full, just in your part for being the very first originator of murder. So you wouldn't be responsible for somebody else committing any type of murder, uh, but rather it's, it's the um, act being the very first act of its time. So I'm hoping that uh, Asadi can give us a little bit of um, explanation here on this particular verse. Let me just locate it really quickly. Uh, okay. So here we go. He says, that is, so this is this is starting back from verse 527. So where it says in recite to him the story of Adam's two sons. So uh, this is where he begins. That is, tell the people about what happened between the two sons of Adam in truth so that people reflect and learn from it because it is true and is not a lie. It is serious and is not a joke. What appears to be the case is that the two sons of Adam were his own sons, as is indicated by the apparent meaning and context of the verse. This is the view of the majority of commentators. In other words, tell them the story of what happened when they offered a sacrifice which led to the situation described here. 
when each offered a sacrifice to Allah, that is, each of them set aside some part of his wealth in order to draw closer to Allah, it was accepted from one but not from the other. This was known either through revelation from heaven or through the custom that prevailed amongst earlier nations. The sign of Allah's acceptance of a sacrifice was that fire would come down from heaven and consume it. The latter said, that is, the son whose sacrifice was not accepted said to the other, out of envy and resentment, I will surely kill you. His brother said to him, try to speak gently to him. Verily, uh, uh, excuse me, his brother said to him, trying to speak gently to him, verily Allah only accepts from those who fear him. What sin or offense have I committed that would dictate that you should kill me? apart from the fact that I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fearing him is obligatory for both you and me and for everyone. The more correct view concerning the meaning of fearing Allah here is that what is referred to is those who show the quality of fearing Allah in doing that action of sacrifice in the sense that their action is done sincerely for the sake of Allah following the sunnah of the prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he told him that he did not want to kill him either on his own initiative or in self-defense. As he said, even if you raise your hand against me to kill me, I will not raise my hand against you to kill you. And this is not cowardice or incapability on my part. Rather, it is because I fear Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and the one who fears Allah does not commit sins, especially major ones. This is aimed at warding off one who, ki who wants to kill, telling him you should fear Allah. And I would rather you were burdened with, with, that is, that you should end up carrying your sin against me as well as your own sins. That is, if there is a choice between being killed or, you, uh, or, or being killed by you, then I would prefer that you should kill me and thus be burdened with the sins of us both. And thus became one of the uh, thus beca uh, became one of the inhabitants of the fire, such as the recompense of the wrongdoers. This indicates that murder is a major sin, and that one who commits it deserves to enter hellfire. But the offender was not deterred by that, and he still determined to go ahead with the, with the action. So he responded to his evil inclinations and killed his brother, whom he should have respected according to the laws of Allah and nature. Okay, so then it carries on and says. Uh, Indeed, I want you to obtain thereby my sin, your sin, so you will be among the companions of the fire. So he did expand a little bit upon that, but um, it didn't provide too much detail as I was hoping for, which is fine. We could reach other tefasir to see um, what's up. But just a recap, uh, basically what he said very quickly is this indicates that the murder is a, a, murder is a major sin um, and that uh, that you should end up carrying your sin against me as well as your own sin. That is, if there is a choice between being killed, uh, excuse me, if there is a choice between between being, uh, it's just the trans translation is kind of funky here. If there is a choice between killing you or being killed by you, then I would prefer that you should kill me and thus be burdened with the sins of us both. And I think it's referencing to that act specifically. So we'll just leave it at that because he didn't um, he didn't expunge on it any any more than that, which is which is fine. So it's referencing to this particular context. Uh, indeed, uh, excuse me. It says, and the soul and his soul permitted to him the murder of his brother, so he killed him and became among the losers. Then Allah sent a crow searching, scratching the ground in the ground to show him how to hide the disgrace of his brother. He said, "Oh woe to me! Have I failed to be like the crow?" and hide the disgrace, which is the body of my brother, and he became of the regretful. Okay, so uh, this is actually pretty profound in a sense that it's now starting to, um, it's now starting to show us uh, the act of regret. Now, uh, we do have one really cool thing here within this tafsir, and I think it's expanded upon by, uh, from a hadith, uh, which is both in a tabarani as well as Bukhari. And I think this is the thing that I was uh, looking for. So uh, here is here is the explanation in regards to the um, setting forth the precedent, right? So committing a sin and setting forth a precedent. The offender was not deterred so that he was still de uh, determined to go ahead with his action. So he responded to his evil inclination and killed his brother, whom he should have respected according to the laws of the law and nature. And then here is the, here is the uh, additional golden nugget. Whoever sets a bad precedent will have the burden of that sin and a burden like that of everyone who does likewise until the day of resurrection. And that's recorded in a Tabarani. 
Hence, it is, it is stated in the Sahih Hadith that no one kills another person, but the first son of Adam will have a share of the guilt because he was the first one to set the precedent of killing. And that's both in Bukhari and Muslim. When he killed his brother, he did not know what to do with him because he was the first of the sons of Adam to die. Then Allah sent a crow which scratched at the earth that is to, dug, to, is, that is to uh, dig a hole and to bury another crow that had died to show him thereby how to conceal his brother's corpse that is his body because of the body of the deceased is something that is, uh, is to be covered, which uh, there's an aura to it. And he became one of the remorseful, such as the consequence of sin, regret, as well as uh, loss. So a pretty good, pretty good explanation right there. And that was the, the two hadith that I was uh, referencing in my mind's eye. Um, obviously, I didn't know them word for word, but um, you can look into further detail if you wish. But just remember that if you're setting the precedent on something, especially something grave like this, then um, you're going to share a portion of that uh, guilt, which is the, not the sin itself, but the actual precedent setting. Okay. So that way that there's no uh, confusion. All right. Uh, perfect. Next page. Okay. Um, likewise, uh, sorry, just another small tangent. Likewise, if you set the precedent of doing something good, uh, you'll get a reward for the precedent of doing something good, but it'll be uh, multiplied uh, many fold, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, because of that, uh, we decreed upon the children of Israel that uh, that whoever kills a soul unless for, uh, excuse me, uh, because of that, we decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul unless for a soul or for corruption done in the land, it is as if he had slain mankind entirely. And that's a very uh, strict stance. So in Islam, if you if you um, basically murder an innocent, it's as if you've murdered all of mankind. Like that's, that's pretty great, right? Um, and whoever saves one, it is as, as if he had saved mankind entirely. So now you have the opposite, right? So now maybe you can see why there's like such a giant push for Muslims to enter into the field of like being a doctor or something like, you know, an emergency trauma surgeon or something like that, right? Uh, and whoever saves one it is as if he had saved mankind entirely. And our messengers had certainly come to them with clear proofs. Then indeed, many of them, even after that, throughout the land were transgressors. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from the opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in this world and for them in the hereafter a great punishment. So remember, it's not just about um, it, it's not just about like apostasy or something like that. You're actually waging war, which means you're campaigning against the truth. OK, and uh, it's taken very, very seriously. Right. Very, very, very seriously. And you're not only campaign campaigning against the truth, but this is a warning to anybody who is campaigning against the messenger. Right. And that goes for every single messenger. Right. If you were to campaign against them, you can't you're waging war against God. Right. That's why the, the punishment is so severe, except for those who return repenting before you overcome or apprehend them and know that Allah is forgiving and merciful. And again, a constant theme of mercy. Right. Hey, you know what? You realized your mistake. Uh, no problem. Just repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and change your ways and you're good. Everything's fine. Just carry on. Okay. Oh, you who have believed, fear Allah and seek the means of nearness to him and strive in his cause that you may succeed. Indeed, those who disbelieve, if they should have all that is in the earth and the like of it, uh, of it with it by which uh, to ransom themselves from the punishment of the day of resurrection, it will not be accepted from them and for them is a painful punishment. Now, previously, in the previous chapters, what we read was that if you had the weight of gold in the size of the earth, okay, so if you had the whole earth in, 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 in whole earth's weight in gold, you would try to ransom it. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upping the ante. He's saying not only did you want the whole weight of the earth, 
but you're going to say, I also have another something like it. Okay, so now you've got double, but it's not going to work, right? So keep that in mind. Um, that that just imagine how uh, serious the situation is going to be, and how much these people are going to want to get out of their desperate state. That's the that's the key takeaway that I'm getting here. That they're going to be like, I'll give, I'll give you everything, and I'll multiply it double, right? Um, they will wish to get out of the fire, but never are they going to emerge therefrom. And for them is an enduring punishment. As for the thief, the male and the female amputate their hand in recompense for what they have earned, i.e. committed as a deterrent punishment from Allah, and Allah is exalted in might and wise. And again, this is another hot, uh, hot topic. So um, I'm going to expunge on this with the uh, tafsir. Now, I personally know that there needs to be conditions that are met. So um, let me see what the tafsir says. But I know that there needs to be conditions that are met of like value, uh, what the, the item was stolen, what's the condition of the person doing the stealing, um, is the, is the uh, state of the government in a particular way where it is having mass poverty, uh, is the person hungry, are they stealing food, so what is the type of item that was stolen? Is it a, a mugging or is it a, a, a silent stealing? These are all different conditions, right? So like a lot of people, they talk about, oh, you know, you guys like chop hands off of thieves. No, <laughs> it's not how it works. We have to follow the due process and we have to see if the conditions are indeed met. So let me let me read what the tafsir says. So this is from Asadi again. So he says, the thief is the one who takes another person's property that is protected by Sharia. First condition. In a, a surreptitious manner, Second condition, without the owner's consent. Third condition, okay? It is one of the major sins that dictate a severe punishment with his amputation of the right hand as is specified in the recitation of some of the Sahaba, which are the companions. The had punishment entails cutting off their hand from the wrist. If a person steals, his hand is to be cut off from the wrist. Then the bleeding is to be stopped by cauterizing it with hot oil. This is the punishment mentioned in general terms in the Quran, but the Sunnah restricts the general meaning of this verse in a number of ways. So let's take a look at the restrictions. Okay, we know the ruling. Now it's time to take a look at the concessions and the, and the restrictions. That the stolen item sh uh, should have been taken from the place where such items are usually kept safe. Okay, so like if what comes to my mind is if it you know, oh, let me read what he says. If it is stolen from some place other than that, then the thief's hand is not to be cut off. So if somebody is in like a marketplace or a public setting, okay, that violates one of the conditions, right? And you can't chop the person's hand off. Uh, that there should be a minimum value for the stolen property, which is one quarter of a dinar or three dirhams or whatever is equivalent to either of them. If the stolen property is of less value than that, then the thief's hand is not to be cut off. Now, mind you, this is in regards to uh, money at the time. So we would have to take a look at what the equivalent value of something like that is today. And I'm sure that there would be uh, the similar standard of utilizing uh, gold and silver, right? Which is dinar and dirhams, this is gold and silver, okay? So one quarter of, a, of, a, of an ounce of gold. So go, you know, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip in a sense of like one quarter of an ounce of gold um, or three, uh, three ounces of silver, okay? So we have to wait what, what's what, all right? This may be understood from the word... Uh, a sariqa, which is theft, and its meaning. This word refers to taking an item in such a way that it is not possible to protect against. This applies if it is stored properly. If it is not stored properly and is taken, this is not theft per se, according to Sharia. Wisdom also dictates that the hand should not be cut off for the theft of a trivial item. Okay, now, it's not. he's not saying that it's not stealing. He's saying that it is not a sariqa which is a type of theft, okay? So it's not like, hey, you can go willy-nilly and just take a bunch of stuff and don't worry, it's not theft if it doesn't, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that it has to be of a particular criteria for the had punishment, and it has to meet that criteria of it being properly defined as a sariqa, so that the punishment is now justified, okay? Wisdom also dictates that the hand should not be cut off for theft of trivial items. 
as there must be a set definition of what is valuable, the shari text makes clear the minimum value. The wisdom behind cutting off of the hand as a punishment for the theft is so that this will protect people's property as people will be cautious lest the limb that committed the crime be cut off. If the thief steals again, his left foot is to be cut off. If he does it again, it was suggested that his hand, his left hand be cut off, then his right foot, or that he would be detained until he dies. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I'm pretty sure that because this is functioning as a deterrent, if the crime was, uh, was justified uh, and uh, the person's hand would be chopped off, okay, in, in this instance, I am... I am like 99% positive the person is not going to do it again. Now, likewise, because this is such a severe deterrent, I don't think that somebody's going to want to commit the crime from the get-go. All right? Because when you're talking about, oh, yeah, you can be in jail for like, you know, 10 days or whatever. Um, and uh, these things, you know, in regards to losing a limb, no, I'm not going to take that chance. And I'm pretty sure many, many people will not take that chance. Okay? So... Uh, a wonderful explanation by Sadi. Indeed, the penalty for those who wait, uh, excuse me, I read that one already, except for those who return repenting. Okay, wonderful. Uh huh. Okay. Lovely. I found my spot back again. Okay. Uh, so uh, we covered as for a thief. Now, but whoever repents after his wrongdoing and reforms, indeed, Allah will turn to him in forgiveness. Uh, indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So once again, once again, you have an avenue of being forgiven. So Islam is taking the position of mercy and it would be interesting. I'm not going to dedicate the time to it right now, but it would be very interesting to see during the due process, if somebody is indeed committed to that type of theft, the asariqa theft, if they plead for mercy and they seek for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if, no cutting would to take place if they were to meet the condition of reforming themselves. Okay. And I do believe, I really do believe that this is the case. And the reason why I say this is because our bodies belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were given to us on a temporary basis and will return back to him. Right. Just like everything belongs to him. Okay. Now I'm going to encourage you to conduct your own research and, 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 um, Dig into the thick of it yourself, if you will. But it is something pretty interesting. Okay, carrying on. Do you not know that Allah, to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth? And again, here, you know, I literally just said everything belongs to him. So that's kind of further reinforcing that belief that I, that I had just mentioned. But I'm going to have to do my, my uh, deeper due diligence on that. He, punishment, he punishes whom he wills and he forgives whom he wills. And Allah is over all things competent. Again, reinforcing that uh, statement that I made. O oh, messenger, let them not grieve you who hasten into disbelief of those who say we believe with their mouths, but their heart believes not. And from among the Jews, they are avid listeners to falsehood, listening to another people who have not come to you. They distort words beyond their proper places, which is also their usages, saying, if you are given this, take it. But if you are not given it, then be aware. But he for whom Allah intends fitna, which is a trial, never will you possess power to do for him a thing against Allah. Those are the ones from whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts. For them in this world is disgrace, and for them in the hereafter is a punishment. They are avid listeners to falsehood, devourers of what is unlawful. So if they come to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa judge between them or turn away from them. And if you turn away from them, never will they harm you at all. And if you judge, judge between them with justice. Again, justice. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. But how is it that they come to you for judgment while they have the Torah, in which is the judgment of Allah? Then they turn away even after that, but those are not, in fact, believers. Indeed, we sent down the Torah in which was guidance and light. The prophets who submitted to Allah judged by it for the Jews, and as did the rabbis and scholars by that with which they were entrusted of the scriptures of Allah, and they were witnesses thereto. So do not fear the people, but fear me, and do not exchange my verses for a small price, a worldly gain, 
and whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the disbelievers. And remember, they exchanged it for a small price, so they violated the condition. And we ordained for them therein a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear, and a tooth for a tooth. And for wounds is legal retribution. But whoever gives up this right as charity, it is an expiation for him. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the wrongdoers uh, and they are unjust. Now, I will say this. It is probably extremely difficult. Uh, especially when some type of wrongdoing was committed and it's a loss of life for somebody to show mercy. So I can only imagine what the reward for something like that would be, right? Um, what comes to mind, I don't know if you guys remember this, but what comes to mind was there was a guy who uh, I think his son was murdered a long time ago and um, they were in the court. And this is, I think this was in, in the United States. They were in the court and the guy um, was talking to the 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 victim was talking to the uh, perpetrator and the victim was like i uh, i forgive you because i'm muslim and i my reward is with my lord and i i didn't follow up on the story right it happened so long ago i want to say it happened like seven or eight years ago but it was like national news right because this guy was just so um nice to the person that killed his kid and uh, he really showed the beauty of Islam there, right? So I can only imagine what his reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we sent following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah, and we gave him the gospel. Now, this is not the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. This is the Injil. So this is the gospel of Isa, which we don't have anymore. Um, in which was guidance and light and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. And let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are defiantly disobedient. Now, interestingly enough, the people, uh, the Christians can no longer judge by what was given to Isa because it's not preserved. It's not preserved. They don't have the Injil. So they have to default to the Quran, subhanAllah. Um, but they choose not to, right? And that's why they're missing certain judgments. They're missing judgments on what to do for divorce. Uh, there, I don't think that there's anything in regards to inheritance over there. Um, I don't, actually, it's not possible for a woman to divorce in Christianity, right? So you're stuck. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have to pay 50 shekels to the person that commits like rape. You have to marry the guy and then there's no divorce. So it's it's just a mess. And uh, we have revealed to you, uh, carrying on number 48, and we have revealed to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the book, i.e. the Quran in truth, confirming that which preceded it of the scripture and as a criterion over it. So here we have the criterion. We have the, the Muhammad, right? Um, this is a, uh, the Quran is a, uh, a judge over previous scriptures. So for anybody that chooses to, ref that refuses, right? And notice the chronology here, right? So he talks about, Allah Subhanahu talks about the Injil, and then he talks about the, um, the Quran being the final revelation and uh, the truth, right? Confirming certain things uh, which preceded it of the scripture and as a criterion over it, right? So if you ever have somebody saying, oh, we have to look at the Bible first and then look at the Quran, not according to Islam, not according to the Quran, you got to flip it. It's the other way around. The Quran is the criterion. So judge between them by what Allah has revealed and do not follow their inclinations away from what has come to you of the truth. To each of you, we prescribe a law and a method. Had Allah willed, he would have made you one nation, united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given you, so race to all that is good. To Allah is your return and, uh, and all together, and he will then inform you concerning that which you used to differ. So again, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, I have the power to make you guys all believe. I have the power to make everything, you know, but the idea is that it would violate the test, Okay. So the test is plain and simple, and you have to conduct your own research and due diligence and come to your own conclusions. Because remember, there's no compulsion in Islam. There's no compulsion in religion. So Allah tells you, you have access to this stuff. 
alhamdulillah, you know, for the people that are tuning in and stuff there, you are actively conducting this research and, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to guide everybody. Uh, and, and judge, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, between them by what Allah has revealed and do not follow their inclinations and beware of them, lest they tempt you away from some of what Allah has revealed to you. And if they turn away, then know that Allah only intends to afflict them with some of their own sins. And indeed, many among the people are defiantly disobedient. So here's another criteria of disbelief, being defiantly disobedient. Right. And pair that with arrogance, pair that with jealousy, pair that with envy, pair that with all the other um, criteria that we put. And you've got a recipe for someone who really like they're in a state of disaster. Then is the judgment of the time of ignorance they desire. I'm going to reread that. Then is it the judgment of ignorance they desire? But who is better than Allah in judgment for a people who are certain in faith? So if somebody chooses to be defiantly disobedient and chooses to be in a perpetual state of ignorance, then it's only befitting that they receive whatever the consequence of their decision is, right? O oh, you who have believed, do not take the Jews and the Christians as allies. They are, in fact, allies of one another. And whoever is an ally to them among you, then indeed he is one of them. Indeed, Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. Now, obviously, um, there is context to this and there's conditions to this. Uh, allyship, again, we covered previously. This is things like if at times of war and, uh, you know, at times of like there's espionage and all that stuff going on and you're trusting somebody with the deepest, deepest, deepest um, secrets, okay? So you don't trust people that are your enemies with your deepest secrets, and nor would you consider them as allies. You can still have friend, Jewish friends and Christian friends and all that other stuff, but in regards to trusting them with your deepest secrets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a warning for that. So you, so you see those in, in whose heart is disease, which is hypocrisy, hastening into association with them, saying, we are afraid a misfortune may strike us, but perhaps Allah will bring conquest or a decision from him, and they will become over what they have been concealing with, uh, within themselves regretful. And those who believe will say, are these the ones who swore by Allah their strongest oath, and that indeed they were with you? Their deeds have become worthless and they have become losers. O oh, you who have believed, whoever of you should revert from his religion, Allah will bring forth in place of them a people he will love and who, he, who will love him, who are humble towards the believers, strong against the disbelievers. They strive in the cause of Allah and do not fear the blame of a critic. That is the favor of Allah. He bestows it upon whom he wills, and Allah is all-encompassing and knowing. So here's the deal. Um, naturally, if you're interested in religion, there is a massive spiritual component to it. And we believe in the unseen. And the idea is, is that if you fall out of it by choice, okay, not just simply by choice of saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to have this emotional choice, but by your choice of commitment to wrongful actions, which is going to have the consequence of a lost path that I guiding you towards disbelief. Okay. So if you're constantly choosing crappy actions and to be a, an, an unjust, unrighteous person, your natural consequence is going to fall into disbelief. A lost path that is going to replace you with the ones that he loves, which are choosing righteousness. And if you think of humankind, how it's constantly going and ebbs and flows, it's not just somebody is constantly in a state of righteousness and constantly in a state of this, constantly state of that. We're just going up and down and up and down and up and down. But the ultimate choice to leave, to leave is, again, I cannot find a single logical reason to leave Islam. Rather, it boils down to following somebody's own personal desires. And it really just trickles down to it being an emotional thing, right? Whether they want something like partying or this, that, and the third or but remember, it's going to file under the category of the characteristics of disbelief, which is all the things that I previously had mentioned in the Quran. Okay. Your ally is none but Allah and therefore his messenger and those who have believed those who establish prayer and give zakah, which is charity, and they bow in worship. And whoever is an ally of Allah and his messenger though, uh, and those who have believed indeed the party of Allah, they will be 
the predominant. O you who have believed, take not those who have taken their, your religion in ridicule and amusement among the ones who were given the scripture before you, nor the disbelievers as allies. And fear Allah if you should truly be believers. And by the way, you know, you can test this stuff out very easily. If you were to open up a, sub a subject of uh, religion with people and they go, I don't have time for that stupid stuff or you believe in that, you know, backwater, blah, 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 blah. They're ridiculing, right? They're ridiculing. And why would you want someone that doesn't want truth, that doesn't seek justice, that doesn't hold himself to a standard that the creator would hold himself to or herself to as an ally? Because they could just turn on you in a, in a, on a dime, right? They don't feel responsible for anything or accountable for anything. And they can just kind of do whatever. Their, their internal desires are going to want to take advantage of you, whether that be for money, whether that be for a relationship, whether that be for blah, 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 blah. You'd name it, right? And when you call to prayer, uh, they take it uh, they take it in ridicule and amusement. That is because they are people who do not use reason, okay? So anybody that's using their reason, they're going to take it seriously, meaning the whole, the whole concept of getting to know their creator and recognizing their purpose uh, of existence. Say, O oh, people of the scripture, do you not, uh, do you resent us except for the fact that we believe in Allah and what was revealed to us and what was revealed before? And because most of you are defiantly disobedient, that's a great question. Why, why, why the hate? You know, why the hate? Uh, say, shall I inform you of what is worse than, than that as penalty from Allah, it is that of those whom Allah has cursed and with whom he became angry and made of them apes and pigs and slaves of Tahut, which is idol worship. Those are worse in position and further astray from the sound way. So obviously this is talking about uh, metaphorically where people are becoming uh, slaves of their own desires and now they're worshiping their own desires and associating partnership as a form of idolatry, okay? Uh, and when they come to you, they say, we believe, but they have entered with disbelief in their hearts and they have certainly left with it. And the law is most knowing of what they are concealing. And you see many of them hastening into sin and aggression and the devouring of what is unlawful. How wretched is what they have been doing. Okay. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the characteristics Then just take a look at the people. Take a look at you. I mean, like, I know this might sound a little bit petty, but um you know i see like these tiktok videos that are coming up where like people are literally just blind punching other people did you imagine like for the or like they're they're aggravating other people for the purposes of like generating content and likes uh or like what do they call it rage baiting they're getting people so angry at the actions that they're conducting you know subhanallah they have completely lost their mind completely lost their mind Okay. Um, carrying on, why do the rabbis and religious scholars not forbid them from saying what is sinful and devouring what is unlawful? How wretched is what they have been practicing? So it's addressing the leadership here. Okay. Which is, it's pretty serious guys. And the Jews say the hand of Allah is chained. Chained are their hands and cursed are they for what they say. Rather, both his hands are extended he spends however he wills, and that which has been revealed to you from your Lord will surely increase many of them in transgression and disbelief. And we have cast among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. Every time they kindled the fire of war against you, Allah extinguished it, and they strive throughout the land, causing corruption, and Allah does not like corruptors. And something to me that's a huge sign of uh, the prophet's... Um, the, the Prophet and his miraculous life is imagine, imagine going into a society that's riddled with paganism, massive amounts of hate, tribal, and you survive. You deliver the message over the course of 23 years after countless assassination attempts in a barren land, and you actually survived. You know what I'm saying? It, every single odd was stacked up against this guy. And he actually did it. To me, that is just, I smile ear to ear as to how miraculous that is. I mean, that's proof enough alone. Okay. 
Uh, and if only the people of the scripture had believed and feared Allah, we would have removed from them their misdeeds and admitted them to the gardens of pleasure. And if only they had upheld the law of the Torah, the gospel, and what was revealed to them from their Lord, i.e. the Quran, they would have consumed provision from above them and from beneath their feet. Among them, there are a moderate, acceptable community, but many of them, evil is that which they do. O messenger, announce that which has been revealed to you from your Lord, and if you do not, then you have not conveyed his message, and Allah will protect you from the people. Indeed, Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. So here's the promise, promise of Allah that he was going to protect them. So, you know, subhanAllah, the very uh, little intermission that I had in my brain um, that I spewed out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed him protection. Go and deliver the message, and I will protect you. And alhamdulillah, that is exactly what happened. Okay. Say, O people of the scripture, you are on nothing of the truth until you uphold the law of the Torah and the gospel. And again, this is the Injil. And what has been revealed to you from your Lord. This is the Quran right there, i.e. the Quran. So you have to uphold the law of do, 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 everything, including the Quran. And because the Quran is the final revelation, you have to uphold the Quran. And that which has been revealed to you from your Lord will surely increase many of them in transgression and disbelief. So do not grieve over the disbelieving people. And why is it going to increase them in transgression and disbelief? Can anybody chat it in? Okay, ding, ding, ding. Because they have all the characteristics previously aforementioned and they're trying their best. They're trying the best to retain ownership and keep a secret. So they're perpetually upon disbelief emulating those characteristics of envy, jealousy, uh, fraud, uh, injustice, blah, 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 blah. And that is why it's going to increase them in disbelief because they don't want to give up what they have. They're greedy people. And that goes for anybody that's a disbeliever, okay? Uh, indeed, those who have believed in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those before him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were Jews or Sabians or Christians, those among them who believed in Allah and the last day and did righteousness, no fear will there be concerning them, nor will they grieve. Okay? We had already taken the covenant of the children of Israel and had sent to them messengers whenever they came to them a messenger, whenever there came to them a messenger with what uh, their souls did not desire a party of messengers they denied and another party they killed. So not only did they deny messengers, but obviously they committed the heinous act of, of uh, eliminating them. And they thought there would be no resulting punishment. So they became blind and deaf. Then Allah turned to them in forgiveness. Then again, many of them became blind and deaf and Allah is seeing of what they do. So again, they did wrong showed mercy, they did wrong again, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing of what they do. It's like, how many chances do you want, man? How many chances do you want? So imagine how many messengers were sent and how many were denied and what type of actions were conducted to these uh, messengers. They have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. <laughs> like, incredible, incredible, right? Is exactly what's happening today exactly what's happening today while the messiah has said "O oh, children of israel worship allah worship allah my lord and your lord somebody go open up the bible verse john 20 17. go open up john 20 17 right now where jesus says i go to my father and your father my god and your god boom right same thing it's just crystal clear indeed he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise and his refuge is the fire and there are not for the wrongdoers any helpers. They have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the third of three and there is no God except one God. And if they do not desist from what they are saying, there will surely, uh, they, there will surely afflict the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. So will they not repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness? And Allah is forgiving and merciful? Again, he's opening up the door again. This is clear, clear cut, opening up the door saying, look, just seek forgiveness. Um, and, 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 you know, 
ask and I will give it to you. I'm so merciful. I will give it to you. The son of Mary, again, the, the Messiah, son of Mary. Notice always son of Mary, son of Mary, son of Mary, son of Mary. The Messiah, son of Mary, was not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. And his mother was a supporter of truth. They both used to eat food. This is the Quranic argument. And it's meant so that everybody can understand. It does, it's not giving you some, you know, crazy, detailed, in-depth, wild argument of searching this and intricacies, that, and having something be, it's the absolute simplest and most effective argument. They both ate food, okay? And notice he says they both ate food. And that's because it's referencing to the Christians that have elevated Mary to a status of divine, okay? Mother Mary, Mother Mary, Mother Mary. It's uh, the Quran just does like a double slap. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just doing like a quick little double slap of like, yo, wake up. They both ate food. Look how we make clear to them the signs and, and then look how they are deluded. Now, any single person, any single person that is in a, that is using their reason, basic reasoning skills, deductive and inductive, basic, basic reasoning skills would clearly see that Jesus was a human being. He had no divinity to him whatsoever based on the fact that he just ate food. Same thing with Mary, no divinity whatsoever. They ate food and that eating food has consequences like going to the bathroom. Now you're going to tell me that almighty God went to the bathroom. Give me a break. Okay. Uh, say, do you worship besides the law that which holds for you no power of harm or benefit while it is Allah who is the hearing and knowing. Say, O people of the scripture, do not exceed limits in your religion beyond the truth and do not follow the inclinations of a people who had gone astray before and misled many uh, and have strayed from the soundness of the way. Cursed were, the, were those who disbelieved among the children of Israel by the tongue of David and of Jesus, the son of Mary. Again, son of Mary. Now, my, now notice that they cursed here. It says that these prophets cursed these people, uh, the son of Mary. That was because they disobeyed and habitually transgressed. So if you're in a state of habitual transgression, you're in trouble. They used to, uh, they used not to prevent one another from wrongdoing that they did. How wretched was that which they were doing? So people didn't have each other's backs. Rather, they jumped on board, you know, instead of stopping the person saying like, hey, you know what? I think you really shouldn't be doing this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, let's tag along. Let me help you out. <laughs> okay. You see many of them becoming allies of those who disbelieved, which is the polytheist. How wretched is, is that which they had put forth for themselves in that Allah has become angry with them and in the punishment they will abide eternally. And if they had believed in Allah and the prophet and in what was revealed to him, they would not have taken them as allies, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. You will surely find the most intensive people in animosity towards the believers to be the Jews and those who associate others with Allah, which is the polytheists. And you will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers who say we are Christians. That is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not arrogant. Uh, now, this definitely has some really interesting um, ties to like uh, closer to the end times, right? Um, and it's actually even relevant today, right? It's relevant today. The people that are like heavy Zionist and stuff um, and these like evangelical Christians, which are not really Christians, by the way, um, they're, they're all siding with, I mean, they're polytheists, no matter how you spin it, okay? They're polytheists. And those ones are siding with the so-called uh, Zionist Jews today. Now, um, there are many good Christians today as well that actually really do believe in the oneness of God. Although they don't have a good understanding of it expressed through their theology, they do believe that God is one. And if they were to read their scriptures, I believe they would become Muslim. But these ones are siding, for the, uh, siding on truth and siding on justice uh, because they aren't arrogant. Right. They recognize like, hey, you know what? We're not arrogant people and we're willing to learn. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. Uh, and when they hear what has been revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what uh, of what they recognized of truth. They say, our Lord, we have believed. 
So register us amongst the witnesses. Okay, alhamdulillah, uh, we finished the six jizz. So, um, you know, I think there was a lot, a lot of beneficial information here and absolutely amazing, amazing uh, golden nuggets. If people were to just take a moment and read, um, I want to say that, you know, thank you guys so much for your patience with me while I was reading through this stuff. Any mistakes that I have made uh, in my thought process or anything that I have uttered is purely from me. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his uh, beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are free from mistakes.